Okay, hello. This is part two. This is a, a, like a lecture in three parts where I talk about some of the subjects David Engelman brings up in his LiveWired book. He's a, he's a neuroscientist from Stanford, and I'm trying to get into computational neuroscience. Right now, I'm in artificial intelligence. And uh, one of the things he talks about in his book that AI practitioners and neuroscientists will both find interesting is reinforcement learning. So let's dive in. If you want to check out part one or, or the upcoming part three, you know, check out my channel. They're also going to be listed there. As a motivating example for this, I, you know, I, w I want to ask you guys, what should we think about this? And it's a trick question. Uh, we should find this hilarious, but, but truly what I'm trying to get at here is what, what drives these monkeys to become addicted to cigarettes? You know, uh, some monkeys can become drunks just like people. And it's actually like a similar percentage of monkeys can't handle their drinks and become alcoholics as, as uh, the human population. So there's what, what, what framework can we grab to reach for to explain things like this addiction and behavior? And uh, David Engelman talks about this in his book. It's, it's reward learning, it's reinforcement learning. And that's kind of interesting. I, I know those terms from my AI degree, right? This is dynamics programming and RL, uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, from computer science. So where did these psychologists and neuroscientists uh, learn to speak in this in this language? And that's what I kind of dove in trying to figure out. Uh, and you won't be surprised, anybody from the CS side of things won't be surprised that Richard Sutton and Andrew Bartow had their hands in this uh, because they, are, they, are, they wrote the book on reinforcement learning that most of us use. Uh, back in 1981, and then this subsequent paper in response to um, the critiques and, and feedback from the research on their 1981 paper, they came out with this 1986 paper. And it's the first real instance I can find of TD models being used, so a temporal difference model. Um, and, and these are important because nowadays, uh, temporal difference, uh, the, the work they did in this paper led to um, SARSA, uh, Q learning, and actor critic methods, right? Because the critics method part of actor critic drives straight from this type of work. And um, actor critics are behind things like AlphaGo. So uh, you can't just ignore this. This is kind of interesting. <laughs> um, and so what were Rich and Sutton and Andrew Bartow, what, what was motivating them to come up with this model of temporal difference? I um, mean, it was classical conditioning. And so classical conditioning, uh, one thing from there is is blocking. So these these, this blocking has been known since like Pavlov and his dogs going back to the 1920s. Um, so you could take a mouse and show it a light and then give it some cheese a little bit time later. And you can do this pairing many times and then eventually, right, the, the mouse will learn, it'll salivate, right? As a, when you show it the light, it's like, I know there's cheese coming. This is, this is the jam, this is great. Um, but what blocking is, is the light will block the learning of correlation between the note and the cheese. No matter how many times you do this step here, you can do it a hundred times, the, the mouse has been blocked. It will never actually be able to learn that this alone should indicate cheese. Okay, uh, another thing under classical conditioning is, is higher order conditioning. Obviously the, the easiest to explain is second order conditioning. Um, it's very similar, but um, We'll pair the note first with the cheese. It'll learn to expect the cheese when shown the note. Um, but the difference here really comes in, now we're gonna add uh, the thing that, or another sensory cue that would normally get blocked, but we're gonna do it a little bit differently. They're gonna be separated in time. So this new sensory cue, the light, is before the note. And then what's not shown here, sorry about that, we should have something like this, a third step up here. Um, because the, it's already learned that this note means cheese, and it will expect the cheese, but we won't give it the cheese. And so the idea here is, is there's actual error prediction in the reward of cheese. Um, and this is kind of a hint that, that led to some of this work. Um, the main difference, if we go back to blocking, um, the light alone gave a perfect prediction of this uh, upcoming cheese, but here that's not the case. And so this error allowed the model to unfold such that the light isn't blocked anymore. It, it can learn to anticipate the cheese, even though this signal was already learned and is sufficient. 
Okay, so that's back in 19, early 80s, what Sutton and Bartow were looking at, all this experimental data of, of animals um, and their, their behavior with rewards. About a decade later, in 1997, uh, Schultz, Diane, and Reed Montague wrote this paper, and the main takeaway is, is they go, hey, that uh, Sutton and Bartow model you got, that's pretty, we're, we've got some good evidence that that type of error signal from their model that allows their model to learn and be updated, that that's actually encoded in a population of dopamine neurons in a particular part of at least the mammalian brain, right? And then they, they, they show these graphs, and these graphs are from monkeys in a rather controlled environment, um, and they measured those dopamine neurons in that particular part of the brain and their firing activity. And uh, this is a figure from that paper, and it, it's great to kind of elucidate uh, why some of the reason why Sutton and Bartow's linear temporal difference model seems to be in the right vein of explaining things. And, and I have still got some questions, and we'll get to those as well. Maybe it doesn't explain everything. It, it obviously doesn't, as we'll, as we'll come to learn. Okay, same thing with fewer words. Uh, so I'm going to explain uh, what this V hat here is on uh, the figure. Um, and, you know, if you're already familiar with reinforcement learning, go ahead and skip, skip forward or play a double speed whatnot. Um, this V hat is an approximation of the real value function here. In Academy Khan style, or Khan Academy rather style, I will color code this to make it a little easier for you guys learning this maybe the first time. But the value function takes in as input a given time step, and it will tell you how good that situation is, right? Um, as an example, um, the value of my time step right now here um, can be broken up into two things the immediate reward. So I'm sitting here and I'm talking. I'm having maybe a little bit of reward. It's kind of fun to, to talk about this stuff with you guys and share it. Um, but uh, I've also got like a really good lunch after this. So I, and my future discounted reward, it's discounted because it's not guaranteed. It's, it's kind of iffy, right, that I'll get the lunch. Um, uh, th that's also taken into account in, in the value of this given moment. Um, the last thing we need to understand is this blue bit. The, what does the expected thing mean? Um, the expected really just means like a really big average. So I'm going to be in a similar time tomorrow in a similar place, but I might have slightly different action choices. Maybe tomorrow I won't have uh, lunch. Maybe I won't have time to have lunch and I'll get a big negative uh, reward, right? I'll be like, oh, I'm hungry. So the expectation is kind of a big average over multiple similar um, times throughout the day. And so if that's the real uh, value function, you get it from a bunch of data, like kind of like Monte Carlo sampling methods, if you know those, uh, a lot of the times we won't have enough data to make something effective. So we'll, we'll, we'll approximate it. And that's what V hat is, is it's a linear model of weights that we can update to make better and better approximations of the true value function which I just got done introducing. Okay, and at the top, uh, there, this is the actual neurons, and they're saying that their activity level uh, is, is encoding the prediction error. Well, what's the prediction error? And I've got it shown here. Um, you'll notice the model, the learned model, is used twice. Uh, the only difference is, is the, the time, and that's why it's called a temporal difference model, is, is this exact motivation here. Um, the idea is, is that these two terms on the left should equal the term on the right, right? If this model were perfect, uh, this is just something that falls out of the dynamics. Um, and so if, uh, if the latest observed reward here and the discounted future reward equals this, right? The current state's value given the current model, then there's no error signal. Okay. Um, and so that, now that we've kind of got uh, the definitions of these uh, Z axes out of the way, Let's talk about how the experiment went down. Um, at time steps 10 and 20, the monkeys were shown some indicator that the reward is coming. And you know, initially they'd never seen it before, so they didn't know reward was coming, but this is what they should learn to correlate with re future reward. I don't know if they were lights that were shown, they didn't really talk about it in the, in the paper. 
And the reward given at time 60 definitely wasn't cheese, but I've used this earlier with the mouse, so I just decided to stick with it. In reality, the reward the monkeys were given was uh, sugary juice. So let's go through this um, value function. So this learn model, everything's just zero to begin with. The monkeys theoretically aren't expecting anything, right? And that's why the value of every moment is zero. But the corresponding point up here at the very end when the first reward is given is there's a huge spike. And when the when it's on this uh, when it's positive right on the top here, this is to say that the the actual value was higher than the model was expecting. So the monkey wasn't expecting anything, right? It's just been sitting probably in this controlled environment for a long time with no reward, and then all of a sudden one does come, and so the the dopamine neurons are just going to fire like crazy, encoding, "Hey, you underestimated the value of this moment." and they will do another trial right trial two will happen they'll show the sensory cue sensory cue number two and then here uh, the value function hasn't gotten quite hasn't updated enough so there will be another update there will be more activity and then as these trials keep going on uh, that original sensory cue even though it's been learned right like the value is actually correct here this error will keep propagating backwards in this slowly diffusing wave um, and, it, and this is the driving force. It's harder to tell here. There is this ripple, and that's the driving force that keeps pulling up the values as the trials go on. And then this wave kind of crashes it into time step 9. The earliest sensory cue is at time step 10. This is the part that confused me a little bit. They only had one line explaining in the paper what was going on here, and they said that this is a result of the unpredictability. Like time step 9 is can't is not supposed to be able to be correlated with the reward the, the sensory cue that's given at 10 right and so uh, the td error there i guess i wouldn't expect it to be so clear cut um, why is the model not updating and kind of having this back and forth um, if time step nine is actually more valuable because there's immediate future reward um, it seems like the model can actually tell that those two aren't correlated but the temporal difference model of Sutton and Bartow, I wouldn't actually expect it to be so clear cut. I would expect a, a tug of war back and forth given the way these models update. So if you know the answer to that, please let me know. That would be fantastic. What, what is going on there? And if you were curious what's going on with this big hole, this big dip, and this kind of uh, dimpling wave, this is just what happens um, in the model and in the neuron activity went around trial 30, later in the trials, the, the reward, uh, or the experimenters just actually withheld the sugary juice. They with, withheld and didn't give the reward the monkeys were anticipating. Okay, and so that's gonna be part two. Uh, part three is coming up, um, and that's gonna talk about how the brain uh, essentially wires itself. Um, yeah, if you like this stuff or you wanna see something uh, next time in particular about neuroscience and AI, please let me know. All right. Later, guys.